My name is Simi. So I work um, in De Montfort University. Um, my background is in law, so I'm a lawyer. I'm not so much of a scientist, but I work with them in terms of um, compliance. So I've done a bit of compliance in corporate sector for my PhD. Um, I now do compliance in applicable laws, so majorly the data protection, um, general data protection regulation and other European regulations in terms of data protection. So my role critically at the HBP is to ensure that the HBP um, complies with legislations, the partnering projects and the co-design projects that they work with also comply with applicable legislation. So GDPR, their own local legislations and obviously making sure that you know, um, there is a good balance between privacy and the innovation that we're trying to achieve in the Human Brain Project. So, um, we'll talk a bit about data protection and data ethics. How do we balance big data and data-driven uh, research? So the way we've um, structured it, we, I will talk about data protection, and my colleague Will will be talking about data ethics and how this pans out in the Human Brain Project. Um, okay. So background to data protection, which is you know, very, very important um, for me as a lawyer. Um, we all know about the general data protection regulation. I think in the Human Brain Project, the project itself um, you know, is funded by European Commission, many of the things that they wanted us to achieve, which the project actually um, also agrees with, it aligns with the principles of the HBP, is how to be compliant um, legally and ethically as well. So in 2016, we know about the general data protection regulation. A lot of us would have had to, you know, um, modify our standards in your institutions, organizations to ensure that you're very compliant with GDPR. And some people would have had to sort of um, go to do some training, you know, just to make sure that you're handling data well, what is personal data and issues, you know, around it. Um, just a little bit of background. The GDPR itself came into force in 2016, but there was a two-year transition phase. So you had two years to get ready for it, so that you put in the right standards in place, you put in the right legal measures and um, organizational measures in place if you need to appoint a data protection officer, depending on how big or how large scale your project is, you'd need to consult with a DPO or to, to specially hire one just for the purposes of making you compliant. So in that two years, organizations had to be ready. And the Human Brain Project itself, you know, we had to just modify our standards to make sure that uh, for one, we are complying with applicable laws, which we've been doing prior to 2016, but then ensuring that from 2018, because of the two-year transition phase that I said, we would have appropriate measures in place. We all know that the fine is, you know, skyrocket high. It talks about your annual turnover. So if at that time you're not compliant, there would be some really huge fines which would be applied based on the turnover of your establishment. That would be your headquarters. So if you're Google, for example, it would be your headquarters in um, California and not, you know, in the UK or wherever your, your, your um, presence location is. So the GDPR itself applies to processing of personal data. So it doesn't apply to diseased persons, so the GDPR would not apply to data of people that are no longer with us. Um, there is a contention regarding if, you know, data of somebody who was alive and then becomes diseased, how do you use the consent that you've obtained prior to their, their death continuously even after death? Well, I wouldn't say <laughs> much about that, but that's, that's something else. The GDPR itself also doesn't apply to anonymized data. So there was a little bit of discussion from the last speaker, Ian, on you know, um, data that has been anonymized. Can it actually be anonymized? At what point do you draw the curtain between anonymized, pseudonymized, personally identifiable, and non-identifiable personal data? They all mean you know, different things depending on the context that you use them. But the GDPR itself doesn't apply to data that has already been anonymized. And this in its form would mean that this is data that you cannot in any way trace or link back to the person who's, you know, who's used it. In other words, if it's some numbers or binaries that you can sort of identify the person with, then it's, it's, it's covered by the GDPR. Whether or not we can anonymize data to the fullest, is, in my opinion, practically impossible, especially for scientists. You would need to still be able to trace the origin of this data to be able to see some correlations, to see further developments. What if you get incidental findings, like we talked about earlier? You need to be able to identify the person to whom that data is, data is assigned so you can be able to follow up from there. So 
this is just you know talking about what do you mean by identifiable what kinds of data would be personal data and then the gdpr also talks about special category personal data so data that has to do with ethnic origin racial um, origin or or religious beliefs or political beliefs which is very interesting in this time and age and you know biometric data genetic data especially for scientists they are very um, sensitive and they also have adequate level of protection and um, another level of protection that you have to comply with in the GDPR. So there's a lot of duties that you get in the GDPR. This is just to give you some form of um, <laughs> pictorial analysis of the kinds of um, things that the GDPR has brought. The GDPR you know, is um, an extension of the Data Protection Directive of 95. So before GDPR, we had the Data Protection Directive of 95, which was a framework that the EU came up with, um, all member states of the EU came up with and had to sort of look into in such a way where each country had to write their own from it. So when the GDPR came, because the Data Protection Directive of 95 was becoming obsolete because of the advent of technology and innovations and all of that, the GDPR was directly applicable. So you don't need to write another legislation. Well, you can if you want, like the UK has done with the Data Protection Act of um, 2018, but ordinarily the GDPR is directly applicable. So understanding that each EU country would have to apply it as it is. And if you interact with people in the EU, depending on where you are, even if you're in a non-EU country, but you interact with people within the EU, you would be covered by the GDPR. So the whole idea is what kind of data do you process? So if you're in Africa, if you're in China, if you're in America or any other third country, but you've got data that has to do with people within the EU, then you have to be compliant with the GDPR. And there's a lot of provisions. One of the things, like I said, is the provision of a data protection officer. Another thing is um, data processors. So we've got data controller in the EU directive of 95, which is organizations that have data what about data processors? So even if you don't own the data of people, but you employ another institution to, to own that data, but the people to whom you hold the data do not know about this institution, so they're giving the data to you, but you're not processing it. You're giving it to another company, so that company is the processor. They've also got to comply with the GDPR, and that's a new regulation. Obviously, it talks about consents as well, issues around how do you get consents. And while the previous speaker was talking about you know, informed consents and um, at what level do you say consent is actually freely given, well, the GDPR gives a definition of consent. And it has to be free, it has to be explicit, there shouldn't be any coercion, nobody should force you into it, it has to be something that you do willingly. Whether or not you're in the right frame of mind, if you're, if you're medically sound, and you do not, you, you're not considered to be medically unfit according to your, 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 your documents or your, your medical history, then it would be deemed that that consent is freely given. If you've not explained the reason why you want to use the data, but you're sort of deducing consent, like there was a Google Spain, um, Google France case, I think early this year, where um, the, 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 the uh, Google France was actually asking for consent from, part, um, from the website, but the way they framed the consent, they've sort of tricked people into agreeing from the wording of the consent, and that is what the, 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 the CJEU said, that this consent doesn't look like you're actually asking for consent. It looks like you're telling people that before you can use our website, you just need to consent, and that is not the informed consent that the GDPR is talking about. So you've got transparency, discipline, talks about record keeping, data exports, supervision, and obviously your data protection principles, which was in the previous data protection regulation. So scientific research now. So in the GDPR, scientific research is privileged, which is good. You say, oh, wow, I can use my, my, my data for scientific research because the GDPR allows it. And that's what your Article 89 says, that you know, personal data can be processed for scientific, historical research purposes. But there is a caveat. And the caveat is you have to have legal, organizational, and technical measures in place for processing that data. So whilst scientific research is privileged, and it is actually privileged, there's nothing else we can say about that. 
If you don't have these organizational measures, then it's no longer something you can use freely. So scientists, you know, we, we have to talk about this to scientists to the extent that you're able to use personal data for your research. You have to get the consent. You have to follow your medical ethics. We all know that. But you're allowed to do research with the data that you get. But what kind of measures do you have in place? How do you make sure that this data is if not anonymized, maybe pseudonymized, because that would make sure that you know, you've got um, purposes for processing it, is minimized, you've got the technical measures in place that when you use it, you've got you know, data minimization principles, what about the security you have in place, how do you ensure that you're using it for the right purposes, and obviously rules around secondary use of data. Okay, <clears throat> so you must consider the specific conditions as researchers apply to the disclosure of your research and the kind of um, purpose to which you want to use the data for. And then we'll go to the Human Brain Project, which we probably know, you know much about already. The HBP is a future and emerging technologies project. So it's a 10 years um, project starting from 2013. We're more than halfway into the project. We get into where we build, we build the research infrastructure, which we've called eBrains. And the whole idea is to advance technology through the construction of a research infrastructure. What does it want to achieve? Well, there's a number of things. This is just a few of them. The HBP wants to understand the complexity and the diversity of the brain. Definitely this would involve a lot of research, a lot of collaborative research from scientists to social scientists to you know, technic technicians and a lot of people that would work within the project. We've got over to, um, about 12 um, 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 sub-projects within the project, and my team is in ethics and support, which is SP12. There is a lot of connectivity between us in terms of achieving the same goal, which is building this research infrastructure. Now, in terms of working together, we work with a lot of partners. We also work with co-design um, projects as well, and many of these partners have to comply with applicable laws, and my job is to ensure that this is um, 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 in place within the projects, and and as well as beyond the project. So to create a transdisciplinary community of researchers, the whole idea as well is also to inform future research, to make sure that the research that we're doing can be transferred in a safe way, you know, um, dual use of the research to, to the extent that is possible, and making sure that there's continuity beyond the project. We use different types of data in the project, so you'd find human data, personal data, biometric data, genetic data, um, animal data as well, which is not covered by the GDPR. We have technical and simulation data. And we use these data in different formats. So you find your structured data, the one that is unstructured. What about images, videos, sounds? And there's different levels of people that transfer data for use within the HBP. So some are HBP funded and some are non-funded by the HBP, perhaps co-design projects or people that come to partner with the project looking at the future of the project and wanting to be a part of it. A lot of our partners are in the EU. Some are not in the EU. So we have over 130 partners and many of whom are in the EU and the ones that are not in the EU. The whole idea is to create a platform where we can transfer data freely as possible and as legal as we can. So for the third countries that are not within the EU, many of the things that we do is to ensure the standards that they have in place comply with the laws that we have. So the GDPR would talk about you know, adequate safeguards um, authorities and making sure that you're complying with the authorities if you're within the EU. What about the countries that are not in the EU? So a few of the countries, I think there's about 16 of them, has been approved by the GDPR or by the EU as being compliant. So the GDPR sort of accepts some countries, some of them are, you know, Israel, for example, um, um, US is part of them. So some of these countries are within the countries that have, you know, like the US that has privacy shield and all of that. What about countries that are not um, recognized by the EU as being legally compliant as of yet. How do we deal with these countries? Many of the things that we look at are their ethical you know, safeguards because we know that research is definitely going on around the world. For example, maybe China or some countries in Asia that are definitely undertaking research. Just because they're not part of the EU or the GDPR doesn't recognize them as of yet does not mean that we cannot work with them. So it is the honors of these partners. The, the honors actually lies in 
them to make sure that the data that they're going to be submitting to us is actually compliant with their applicable laws. So sometimes they have a data protection officer. Some of them have you know, an ethics compliant officer, for example. And we look through the, 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 um, their own process. And they go through a, pre, uh, a process of ethics check with the compliance team of the ethics and society, after which we can then you know, confirm that they have the appropriate documents. Whilst we would not go uh, directly to the country to ensure that they're doing it, as researchers, we trust that their compliance with applicable laws effectively complies with the GDPR, and we can work with them on that basis. So the whole idea is to balance the competing interests of privacy and innovation. Whilst the HBP wants to make sure that innovation persists and continues, we want to build this research infrastructure, we want to make sure we've even joined the HBP as part of the International Brain Initiative, which is a conglomeration of other brain initiatives like the HBP across the world. And I think there's about eight of them, perhaps that number has um, increased. And the whole idea is for the HBP to be the leader in terms of um, 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 best, best standards, drawing on best practices, what should be done legally to comply with applicable laws, and also going beyond law to ethical compliance so that other projects can learn from the HBP because the HBP effectively is a very, very massive project. So balancing these distinctions of privacy and innovation can be very, very competing and can be daunting, especially if you're working with scientists and ethicists and you know, um, technicians and social scientists. It would be a lot of discussion and dialogues around data utility, how to make research and innovation more proactive, and also safeguard the privacy and data protection of the individuals to whom you're doing the research. Because effectively, you're working for the society. You're building this infrastructure for the society it would be good to align the process and the outcomes of the research to the needs and expectations of the society. So in the ethics support um, team, we've got um, a few of us, and I think two of us are here today, which is good. And uh, this is not the, the most recent picture, but this is what I could get, <laughs> because we've got quite a few people else in our, um, in our team. But we've got Professor Ben Stahl, who is the, the, the um, manager for SP 12.4, which is how we call it. We are the sub-project 12. Like I said, um, the HBP has got 12 sub-projects. So ethics and society is, um, is sub-project 12. So our compliance manager, Will, we will be talking shortly. We've got the ethics advisory board. We've got ethics rapporteur program. And if you're here in the morning, um, one of the speakers was talking about you know, liaising with the ethics rapporteur. We've got somebody who deals with that in our team here with um, Manuel. And then we've got support outreach and dissemination, because many of the things that we do, we try to put you know, on social media networks and platforms, encouraging our partners uh, to work with us. And oh, we've got data governance. That's not the right person, but anyway. And then we've got the DPO. So um, this is the, the team that we've got, which of course has missed a few people, sorry. So um, the DPO, myself in the HBP, many of have talked about what I do already, which is monitoring compliance with data protection and privacy legislations. It's all about making sure that, especially when we get new partners, we have to look at you know, the, the, what, what they do. And many of these partners are already doing leading research in their field. Perhaps they've come from you know, Spanish um, um, hospitals that have done groundbreaking research. They now want to work and partner with the Human Brain Project. We know already that they're doing groundbreaking breaking research, but we just need to be sure that in the research that they do, there's a lot of legal compliance that they've had to pass through, which has you know, been very good, especially um, in terms of GDPR, and also facilitating compliance, a lot of data protection activities. So it, within the projects, we've got a DPO email address where partners are, are always encouraged, and even other people that will just go on the websites and want to speak to the data protection officer, want to understand more about the HBP, there is um, an, an email address that, um, that would come straight through to me, and I can, I can answer the questions that they have. Another thing that I do is to draft policies, legislations, obviously data sharing agreements between partners, depending on what kind of agreement they want to have uh, within themselves, because sometimes we also, we also facilitate um, other partners meeting each other and all obviously working together beyond the HBP, so we need to make sure that that is also legal. 
as it can be. We do a lot of um, um, European Commission deliverables as part of what we need to provide to the EC. So my job will be to contribute to that, provide support and advice, and obviously attend dissemination events like this, and even the Human Brain Project Summit, which happens every year, to sort of talk about how um, we, we, we conduct our data protection and privacy within the project. The compliance check of the project, which is what I, I said earlier, is what you'd find on the left. And that talks about the steps that we go through when we get a new partner that wants to work with us in the project. We try to go through you know, the, the, the normal ethics check or the normal compliance check, making sure that they've got the right approvals in place. They, we, we speak to them if we have to. We have dialogues within the task leaders. If there's any query, queries, we try and stop it, and then the check is complete. But that is just the legal side of it, to make sure that these partners, whether they are in the EU or not, they have the appropriate measures in place to be able to work with us. And finally, I think I will talk about something that we all want to know, which is Brexit or not. Um, it's really going to be short, but it has to be there, because one of the things that we are also have to bear in mind in the Human Brain Project is the implications of Brexit. So I work in the UK, and you know we all know that the UK wants to come out of the EU as fast as they can, can do it quick enough. So um, by the 31st of October, the HBP has to be ready for onward or continuous processing of personal data. So two things are important that we have to be careful about within the project, because we have a lot of transfers of data from EU countries into the UK, how do we ensure that that complies with applicable laws should the UK become a third country on the 31st of October? First in, is with regards to international data transfers, data exports, which is transferring data from the UK to EU countries, would continue to take place post-Brexit. This is because there's a close alignment between the UK and, other, and EU GDPR. The UK itself has the Data Protection Act of 2018, which really closely aligns, like I said before, with the, with the GDPR. So there is no problem from, you know, if the UK continues to transfer data, if we keep working with other partners and we send data to them. If they want to send data to us, they have to comply with GDPR. We're not the one that would be covered by GDPR because we'd be out of the EU at the time. They have to comply with GDPR, and they have to make sure that you know, that carries on after Brexit. So what we're doing now is standard contractual clauses to be able to show that they have the power, or we have the power, to collect data from them post-Brexit. So with our 130 partners, we are now in the period of drafting a data sharing agreement in the form of SCC that would allow for the continuous um, import of data from the EU. So, and that, I think, is what you find on the next um, paragraph, which talks about how the DPO in itself, as a role, can carry on working um, post-Brexit from the UK. The ICO, which is the Information, Com Information Commissioner's Office in the UK, has actually stated that you know, the UK can carry on working with the EU. If there is a D DPO in the UK, they can carry on working with the EU post-Brexit. It doesn't make much difference as long as they've got the necessary competence in both jurisdictions. Because whether or not Brexit happens, we will still carry on working you know, in the Human Brain Project, but we just have to make provisions for that. So with that, I will stop. And I think uh, my colleague will carry on from here. Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> Thank you. So, um, yeah, so thanks, Simi. That was, that was really good. Um, I'm going to try something a little bit different. You'll notice when I go over to my site, I have basically like four or five words on each page, um, mainly by questions, um, which I think I sort of want you to sort of think about as I'm talking. Um, and if you reach a conclusion on those questions, ask yourself like how you reach that conclusion and, and why, why you think the thing that you, that, you, that you think is the answer to that question. So as Jimmy said, I'm the compliance manager for the HBP. And, and broadly, that means that, um, that I make sure that every individual research task, or every task really in the entire project, we're talking 400 plus individual research projects within the HBP, has ethical approval in place. So tick box, you have the piece of documentation to say yes. And we have to make a judgment whether it's acceptable. Like when you describe what you're doing with your work, if you're doing human research, do you have, does your approval actually cover human research? That's a fairly simple process. But we go through a sort of sh a short in internal review process to make sure that that's, that's acceptable. Um, but what's, what's quite important to say here is that 
the difference between a compliance check and ethics. So I think, I think this is a fairly, a fairly sort of well understood difference that when you receive your, say, an ethics approval letter from your research ethics committee, that doesn't mean ethics is done. And I come up against this particular sort of concept quite a lot. People go, oh no, eth my, our ethics is fine. Look, I have this piece of paper which says we don't have any ethical problems. It's like, oh my God, my head just exploded. Please, if, if you're ever standing in front of any reviewers, never say we don't have any ethical problems because <laughs> they, they will blow a gasket. You, you don't have any compliance issues. But there, in, in every piece of research, there are still ethical things to think about because ethics is about a consideration sort of an ongoing dialogue that you have with yourself, a reflexive process of considering what you're doing and, um, and, and comparing it to, to, to certain standards. So what I'm going to talk about today is, is the friction at that boundary where compliance can go so far, uh, and then it stops. And after that point, when compliance, when, when laws and, and regulations actually don't necessarily apply, but we still have to operate in that area, what do we do in that space? OK. So we're talking about data. Data is not neutral. It's not just something you can pick up and throw around and do with whatever you please. It's not just numbers and text. It's, it has a context. It has cultural and ethical and philosophical implications to handling data. And that's not to mention contractual and legislative implications for handling data as well. And what? a project chooses to do um, with data and what perception they have on their responsibility to that data says a lot about what they think that data can be and what their, what their responsibilities to it are. Um, and I think sort of if you use data, sorry, I am from the UK, as Simi said, and we've just had the B word come up on the screen. Data used and misused can be devastating. It can have wide ranging political effects. So we have to make sure that we're responsible when we do it, we don't misrepresent it, and we handle it appropriately. And used effectively and ethically, data can be a real force for high quality research. So what kind of data do we handle in the Human Brain Project? So we had a slide about, about human data, and we've been talking about data protections. Data protection, the GDPR covers uh, human data. And it covers actually, sort of on a global scale, it's quite a narrow band of data. We're talking about non-anonymized personal data collected within the European Union. That's, that's a reasonably narrow band. That's a lot of data, but on a global scale, it's actually a relatively narrow band because there's a lot of research going on in lots of different countries. Um, but how do we handle data that comes from outside of that jurisdiction? Now, if it's research that occurs in a country where the uh, the ethical culture is different and the, the requirements for things like consent are different. What are the requirements for us, say if we're building, as we are, a research infrastructure to house data? And we have data providers from countries where the legislature is different and they are collecting data in different ways. What are the implications for us for housing that data? Um, we also have... Um, a huge amount, the, the, the vast majority really of the research data that we have in, in the project, at least at the moment, is actually animal data. Now animal data, GDPR is, 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 applies to human data, but clearly it doesn't apply to animal data. Um, and the legislature that covers animal data in the EU is 2010-63-EU, the Directive for the Use of Animals in Research. And I'm sure those of you who do animal research will have heard these, these tenets before, but just to repeat them, that's the idea of the three R's. That is reduction, replacement, refinement. You should seek to produce the same amount of data from fewer animal subjects uh, or, the, or more data from the same amount of animal subjects. That's reduction. Replacement, you should seek to replace animal subjects with non-animal subjects wherever possible. So simulation, robotics, or using secondary data, things like that. Um, and refinement, you should always use the most up-to-date methods so that you re reduce suffering and minimize harm to animal subjects. And then there's an extra R, which isn't, isn't, is never brought up in the three R's, but it's one that they always, they, the EC really like to talk about, which is redundancy, making sure that you're not repeating research where no additional scientific value is gained. But again, we come up against the same thing. If we're talking about EU legislation here, 
talking about EU EC directives. But we know there's a huge amount of animal data being produced outside of the European Union, where actually there's, no, there's not necessarily any compliance requirements for us if we want to house that data in our EU research infrastructure. Legally, we can do that. But what does that mean to do that? What are the implications if we house data from a, from a research project that collected that data in a way that it could not have been collected in the European Union? What does that mean? Should we set requirements that say that if we are going to accept data into our research infrastructure, it must, apply, it must adhere to EU requirements? If we do that, is that a form of ethical imperialism? Are we assuming that because we are Western or because we are European, our ethical values are somehow um, sort of supersede uh, the, the, the local requirements, that, say, in China or, or in uh, South America or South Africa? So these are the kind of questions we, we're having to, to start to engage with because we are reaching the stage in the Human Brain Project where we're in SGA3, Standing Grant Agreement 3, where we are beginning to have to build this research infrastructure. Well, a lot of it has built already, but we have to sort of think about the structures that support it. Um, so we're at the forefront of this sort of these questions of data governance, and we are approaching a global market of data, people from all over the globe, people in different cultures, with different norms and different values, and they may have perfectly defensible ethical positions, but they, don't, they necessarily don't adhere to EU legislature. So what do we do in those situations where they're producing rich scientific data? So what we're, we're doing in, in ethics support and with collaboration with a lot of people um, across the project is a sort of schema of targeted research on data governance, beginning to really drill down to what are the questions, like questions like these, which, which I think are, are quite um, evocative and I don't necessarily have the answers to them. But we're begin, beginning to have to really consider these kind of questions because it's pertinent and it's timely because these are the kind of questions that, that I'm already being asked as compliance manager. I had a, list the, I had a con colleague the other day email me and ask, hi, Will, here's a list of countries, Canada, China, Japan. Which of these countries is safe for us to speak to? <laughs> like, and and the, the wording there is, is quite meaningful, safe. Which of these is safe to, to, to contact? And that's, again, not an easy question to answer, I can assure you. So how are we doing this? Um, we, we, the Human Brain Project has uh, committed to a, an approach of uh, responsible research and innovation, which is a, a sort of approach to research and innovation that uh, looks to engage with stakeholders, not just about how data is collected and how research is conducted, but also with regards to the output of that, of that research. Um, and one sort of quite common definition says that it's, it focuses on the acceptability, the desirability, and the sustainability of that research. Um, there's a lot of different uh, ways to approach research and research schemas, um, but, and, and the uh, RRI approach kind of builds on a lot of things like technology development and things like that. But RRI has been adopted by the European Commission, which is the funder of the Human Brain Project. So it made sense for us to kind of use that approach. Um, and more specifically, we're kind of focusing on the, the area framework, which is uh, anticipate, reflect, engage, act. So think forward about what's coming, reflect upon your conclusions, engage with relevant stakeholders, and then out of those three processes, act and make changes. And really, the ethics support group, although everyone has a part to play in that, we kind of feel that a lot of what we do is about the act part of that. It's about taking those conclusions from that, that schema and, um, and, and putting them into practice in the project, writing standards, writing guidelines, writing SOPs. Um, so, how, what's, what's, what comes out of this? 
How are we going to tackle these, these fairly difficult questions, which I hope, I hope you, can, you agree with me are, are, are tricky that I've put on the board here? Um, well, we have this targeted research, and the idea is that we will produce an eBrains ethical standard, something that takes the legal compliance as a baseline. Obviously, whatever legal requirements we have, you have to, you have to, you have to apply that. But are there requirements above that that we feel we have to adhere to? If we have legislature sorry, uh, data from, from, from lots of different cultures, how are we going to, what requirements will we put on them to make sure that they have to adhere to them when they come and give their data to us in eBrains? And if we set those requirements, how do we, how do we police that, if at all? Not necessarily a simple question. And I think that um, through an international approach, engaging with the IBI, like Simi said, engaging with our ethics advisory board, a, a, a group of experts in the field, we can build a, a set of processes and a, and, and a standard that is um, culturally sensitive, that is reflexive and inward looking and, acknowledgement, and acknowledges its own biases, but one this, which is operational and can be put into practice uh, and rigorous. So that's the idea. And if we can achieve that, then when we reach the end of that process, we can build a research infrastructure which makes a positive contribution to the public good. Okay? And that's me. Thank <laughs> you.